And now finally, the scientific issue. And here there is only one question that matters, and the whole debate in the end focuses down onto this one question, and that is how much warming will you get for a given increase in CO2 concentration? So let's go together, let's fly to the Flinders Ranges in South Australia. There you see a picture, it's some of the most beautiful uh, outback country that you have. And what we're going to do is look at what happened there 750 million years ago in the Precambrian era. Ah oh, yes, I remember it well. <laughs> and we're going to go to the Stubbs waterhole, which is the last surviving remnant of a mile thick glacier that was at sea level, at this location, and at the equator. We can tell from the magnetic signatures of the rocks around there that the, this glacier was at the equator. We can also tell something else about the atmosphere at that time. And we can tell it by looking at this tree, which is the Curly Mallee. Now, the Curly Mallee only grows in two places in the world. One is at Broken Hill, and the other is in the northern Flinders Ranges. And the Curly Mallee grows only on one kind of rock, and it's called Dolomitic Rock. And Dolomitic Rock is composed of something like 40% CO2. From that, we know that that rock was precipitated out of the ocean at this time, 750 million years ago, by a very high partial pressure of CO2 in the atmosphere. In fact, we can work out from the fact that these curly valleys are there and the dolomitic rocks are there, that that glacier existed at the equator, at sea level, at a time when there was, get this, 300,000 parts per million of CO2 in the atmosphere. And yet there was a glacier there. So there's the first of two observations I'm going to make on why we know that CO2 doesn't have the big effect on temperature that the UN says it has. Here is the other. The UN is saying there has been an acceleration in the rate at which global warming has occurred. It's using a bogus graph to do that. I can demonstrate that it's bogus by taking the same data, just the right-hand end of it, and applying four trend lines of my own, which start out showing an increase and end up showing we're heading for a new ice age. Now, if I'm using the same data and the same method and achieving exactly the opposite result, then the method is clearly bogus. What is the true position? It's here on this graph here. We've had three sustained and quite rapid rates of warming, which are exactly parallel. I put down a question in the House of Lords to confirm this, and the government, through gritted teeth, had to admit that it was so. There has been no acceleration in the warming rate. What we do have, if you look at the satellite era on the right there, that's the one era in which we can tell what was actually happening at that time. And we can therefore use satellites to measure not only what temperature was and how it changed over uh, this period from about 1980-83 onwards. And we can also tell how the outgoing radiation from the Earth's surface changed. And it is the relationship between changes in temperature at the Earth's surface and changes in outgoing radiation at the top of the atmosphere that absolutely govern this debate. That's what it's all about. So what we're going to do is we're going to try to explain the one of those three relatively rapid periods of warming that we can explain because we've got satellites there. And here in a paper by Pinker et al. of 2005 is a graph which is pretty boring to look at. You might say, what's going on here? Well, let me add a few details to it so that you can see what's going on. What we have got is a reduction in cloud cover over that 19-year period, 1983 to 2001, a reduction which led to a radiative forcing, as it is called, an extra amount of solar radiation hitting the Earth's surface and going out as long-wave radiation. 3.04 watts per square meter in just 19 years. Now, none of you are gasping at that figure, but it is, in fact, an astonishing figure. The reason why it's astonishing is that the UN's climate panel, which is probably exaggerating, says that the entire human effect on the climate in the 256 years from 1750 to 2005 inclusive is just 1.6 watts per square meter. So here we have an enormous naturally occurring forcing verified in Pinker's paper by four separate methods, which 
occurs, it seems, we don't know why it occurs, it's a natural reduction in cloud cover, then it comes back again, it's a cyclical thing. And from that, we can do a simple calculation. Now, I'm not going to go through this graph in detail, you'll be tested on it later. <laughs> but what I am going to do is just show you very quickly what this means, what the bottom line is here. And the bottom line is this, that if Pinker's measurement is right, and remember, in science, these are always big ifs that we have to check and verify and other people have to come in and look. But if his measurement is right, then we can do a very simple back-of-the-envelope calculation. And I admit it is a back-of-the-envelope calculation. I don't admit this is the last word on the subject. But what it shows is the ballpark within which we're operating here. And what we see is that the warming we would expect to get if we doubled the CO2 concentration in the atmosphere, that is what's known as climate sensitivity, will be about a fifth of a Celsius degree, just a little bit more than a fifth of a Celsius degree. But the UN is saying it would be 3.26 Celsius degrees, 7.5 times too big. Now, that is only a back-of-the-envelope calculation. It's very simple, it's very crude, it's very rough and ready. So, I communicated this result to a team of mathematicians around the world with whom I discuss these ideas from time to time. One of them, at my request, did a more detailed calculation. And he said, sorry, mate, but you're wrong. It's actually at least eight times exaggerated the UN's figure. So if you take away that eightfold exaggeration, an eightfold exaggeration confirmed, remember, by what we saw in the Flinders Ranges 750 million years ago, where if the UN's um, forcing had been anything like as strong as they say, then that would have been, so I'm going to finish in two seconds, and that will be the end of my time. Um, if we, if we uh, look back at that time, and we look at this result, and we look at the result calculated by the mathematician, take away the UN's exaggeration, and you take away the problem. End of the science. Thank you very much. Please welcome Dr. Tim Lambert. Uh, thank you for that warm welcome and uh, thank you to both of you for inviting me to come along and especially to John Smead who organised the whole thing and I had a lovely lunch with him on Tuesday to discuss things. Uh, so who am I, why am I here? You've all heard of Lord Monckton who's this Dr. Lambert guy who's silly enough to debate him. Well, I'm actually a computer scientist. I'm not a climate scientist. Um, I'm as much as an amateur at climate science as Lord Monckton. Um, but I also have a blog where I write about climate science because I think it's interesting and I think it's important. And presumably, since you all came along here, you agree with me to, to learn a bit more about it. And the one thing that, that drives everything